Good morning, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Very, very happy to welcome you here today for this uh, briefing entitled Energy Efficiency, a Win-Win, because that is truly what it is all about. And we are very glad that this briefing is also being held in uh, cooperation with the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. We have a special treat for this briefing today in that we are going to kick it off hearing from two very important leading voices in the House talking about one of their favorite topics as well as one of all of ours uh, in terms of energy efficiency, what it really means, what we can accomplish, why we should be excited and committed and dedicated to truly making it a reality to really bring this country to what it really can be. And Congressman Peter Welch and Congressman Cory Gardner have been leaders in the House. Uh, they have been very, very important voices in terms of galvanizing action, in terms of ensuring that this is a topic that receives attention in providing bipartisan leadership in congressional caucuses focused on energy and energy uh, savings performance contracts and all of which really help us become a more efficient economy, uh, a more efficient society, which is good for all of us. So I'd now like to turn to uh, Congressman uh, Gardner and, and Welch to see which one is going to be the dog and which one's going to be the pony in our little dog and pony show. Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Thank you. Well, I'd say it's uh, good morning. I guess we got 15 minutes of morning left. So how's everybody doing? Uh, I'm I'm Corey Gardner from uh, the great state of Colorado. Uh, how many of you vacationed in Colorado? Just out of curiosity, you've probably never been to my district. It's on the east side of the state and not the west side. So I have uh, uh, the the Great Plains, the High Plains area of Colorado. So it's north, south, and east of Denver, uh, and uh, it's a great district that represents some tremendous energy opportunities for this country, particularly uh, in areas of not only traditional energy uh, but uh, renewable as well. A, a district that has a home to wind energy manufacturing, turbine uh, manufacturing, solar manufacturing, renewable uh, fuels, uh, biofuels, and uh, it's exciting to be here to talk about energy efficiency because nothing says fun like energy savings performance contracts, right? It just rolls off the tongue. Uh, and then you can get even to more fun and talk about USCOs, and that's a fun thing to talk about with utility uh, savings contracts as well. But uh, it's been an honor to work with Peter Welch from Vermont as we talk about ways to really get excited about what we can do in energy efficiency. You know, um, I know it's hard to believe, uh, but we've had a rough time here in Washington the past couple of months. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, not gained that much attention, some of the things that have happening. Nobody's talked about it. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, that Peter and I are so excited about when it comes to energy efficiency is the ability to, to bring Republicans and Democrats and people of all kinds across this country together to talk about something that we know is good for the nation's taxpayers, for our environment, for our economy. Uh, it is a, a, a situation that we find ourselves in where we can bring people around the country together uh, through good policy uh, to talk about energy efficiency and energy savings. Uh, and Peter and I together have started a, a caucus here in Congress called the, uh, the Energy Savings uh, Caucus, the, the, the Energy Performance Caucus, I forget the actual name of the caucus, uh, but it's a focused on energy savings performance contracts where we have a number of members on both sides of the aisle that are simply focused on doing just that. Uh, how can we uh, take advantage of performance contracting to drive energy savings in government buildings? We know the government's the largest user of energy in this country uh, to drive those savings to save taxpayers money, to create private sector jobs, and end up with something that's good for the environment. That's a pretty doggone good outcome in a city that sometimes can't even figure out how to lock the doors at night. Uh, and so we've got to figure out how to, to make Washington function when you have good policies that people on both sides of the aisle can work on together. And I think this is a prime example, and we ought to start here. We ought to figure out how to do just that. Uh, this past week, uh, we led a letter where we had 117 of our colleagues sign on to it to encourage the administration 
to continue the good work that they are doing when it comes to energy efficiency, energy uh, savings, and performance contracts. And 117 colleagues from both sides of the aisle. And when, when we can put Fred Upton and Henry Waxman on the same letter together, uh, we are making things happening. Uh, making, making things happen. So it's, it's an exciting uh, opportunity that we have. And uh, tomorrow we'll be introducing a bill on the utility side of energy savings. Uh, right now there's some restrictions on utilities who can only enter into a, a performance contract for uh, 10 years. Uh, and we'll be introducing a bill tomorrow that allows that to go up to 25 years to take greater advantage of how we can make this energy efficiency program truly work. Now I haven't told uh, Congressman Welch this yet. But as a member of Congress from Colorado, I've really come up with a, another great energy savings idea. We know the Broncos are going to go to the Super Bowl, so we'll just cut the season short here. Now save that energy and play the Super Bowl right now so that we can just go ahead and go to the game. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's the bill that we'll be... No, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is exciting to be here with you and exciting for what you're doing. And I hope that you understand how important your role is in this debate. As you reach out to your member of Congress as you go to their offices to meet with a member, their staff, to engage them and talk about how this is something that everybody agrees to, that we are stewards of our resources, that when we use less of uh, something, it's good because we're conservationists uh, and we can actually promote economic development by, har by, by making sure we're harnessing private sector innovation. So with that in mind, uh, as you go forward today, be excited about what you're doing, because I certainly am. I know Peter is, but I appreciate the, the passion that you bring and the commitment that you bring uh, to this cause as we work for ways uh, to make Washington function in a way that actually benefits the American people. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Peter Welch from the great state of Vermont. Thank you. Corey, thank you. You know, he started out by asking you a question, how many people vacation in Colorado? And I'm going to ask you how many like vacation in a real vacation state. <laughs> you know, it, 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 we've been working at this a long time, and what's uh, it, it really pleasing in a way is that Corey just gave my speech, uh, and he gave your speech, uh, and he spoke for your experience. I mean, we know a couple of things. Number one, uh, the best uh, way to produce energy is to save it. Any kilowatt that we can save, whether it's produced by solar or geothermal uh, or coal uh, or oil, uh, is, is a kilowatt uh, that, is, uh, that we keep in the local economy. And what you guys know, too, is that we can accomplish this in a way that builds our economy. I mean, it's, you know, if you're going to be energy independent and if you want to reduce carbon emissions, 40% uh, of the goals can be achieved through energy efficiency. And energy efficiency means you have to have good engineers, you have to have good mechanics, you have to have good tradespeople, good plumbers, uh, you've got to have good entrepreneurs who can figure out about financing and the allocation of resources. All of that is homegrown. It's all local. It's all good. And it's one of the reasons I think Corey and I have been getting such support among our colleagues, because when we talk to them about this, and then some of you who have businesses in their districts go talk to them and they see, hey, there's folks that are working, they're getting jobs done, homeowners are saving money, B business owners are saving money, that's a good thing. So just more, just you gotta keep it up and it really works. But the other thing, and you touched on it, Corey, you know, the Congress is a mess and it is so important that we get the institution of Congress, which was created by our founders uh, as an institution that is to serve the people of Colorado, of Vermont, of your district and mine, to get it to function. And that's to make decisions that allow folks back home who are doing hard work and want to do good things to be able better to do their job. And we have debates about how to do it, what's the best policy, but there isn't any debate about our obligation to you to create opportunities that you can be successful in your community. You're doing the work. And what is really kind of inspiring to me is that while we've been having our hard times here in Congress, you've been going about your business trying to keep it going. And all of us have had to depend on leadership at the local and the state level as the glue that keeps us together. But what Corey and I see in our efforts with you is that if we can be successful in getting bipartisan cooperation to do practical, sensible things in energy efficiency, 
it's a stepping stone to making Congress work even better on other issues that are more contentious. It's about trust building. It's about seeing that we can emphasize where we have common ground and decide, hey, let's take a few steps forward on the things we agree on, and we'll hold in abeyance things that we disagree on. Corey and I disagree on a lot of things, but you know what? We understand that we agree on this. I mean, I'm not kidding. Everything he said, he said better than I could say. Uh, but I endorse every word of, of what he said. So this is, this is really important. You've been providing leadership. Our responsibility to you is to give you policies that you can A, count on, and then B, it, double down and intensify the efforts you're making back in your communities. And our responsibilities to one another, Corey to me and me to Corey, uh, is that we, as members of Congress, who represent all of America, find a way to emphasize where we agree and where we agree make concrete steps forward so that this can be a functional institution, a stronger country, and a stronger economy. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And Corey and I are very excited about the prospects of this legislation and the other things we're working on moving ahead in this Congress. Thank you. you got to tell them why we start working together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Corey's, <laughs> Corey's, this is the thing we do have in common. Um, we're both cheap, <laughs> and we like saving money. <laughs> so let us save more money. Thanks a lot. No, that's right. <laughs> um, they they can take a few questions. So are there any? This is your chance, because we want to get behind this kind of leadership and really push them, right? Anybody? Okay. Go ahead, please. Do you want to use the microphone? There you go. It's right there. I don't know. He's going to put a damper on something. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in Denver, as a matter of fact. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but I, I don't want to put a damper on things. Uh, what you were saying is certainly makes a lot of sense. But when you tell us to get to our member of Congress and tell him how we feel about it, I ought to say that I'm now in retirement for 21 years without any voting representation in Congress because I live in Washington, D.C. There are 600,000 of us here, which is a whale of a lot more than in Washington. About the same number is in Alaska, North Dakota, and Vermont. Uh, we, we just heard you. Yep, we did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, anything? Uh, so Ken, you, know, you, you mentioned the letter for, uh, that was sent out, the bipartisan <coughs> letter that was sent out. Uh, any expectations or progress or word from the administration on what should be expected from so I think uh, the, the plan is to make a decision on, on extending it in, in the next couple of months. By the end of December, we should have an idea of what they're going to do. Uh, and and we've, I feel very confident that they will. Uh, I know we've, our experience has been to not just say, hey, how are we doing with what we have, but let's figure out how to even do more and do better. So uh, Peter did a great job uh, leading some meetings uh, this past year with the White House. Uh, he, he invited uh, the White House, uh, myself, to his office. Uh, to, and you want to talk about that, but I mean, I think I feel very good about it. I don't know. Well, I think, you know, the, the White House supports this. We're giving congressional support for it. We want to have even legislation expanded more. We have an issue that we've got to resolve on scoring with, the, uh, uh, with, with OMB or the uh, CBO. The CBO. Uh, so there are problems that come up along the way, and we're working on them. And, and the fact that you've got 117 members that really span the ideological spectrum in Congress. And, you know, there's a desire on the part of, I think, the Republican leadership. You saw it with Mr. Cantor the other day when he kind of opened up the agenda and said, what are some of the constructive things that we can work on uh, so that we're not just talking about health care all the time? Uh, and I'm sensing on your side and on our side the, a real desire on the part of members to find some common ground where we can move ahead. And we've laid the foundation uh, when it comes to energy efficiency. Uh, I think everybody in the room here is pro-energy efficiency. Um, in terms of Congress, uh, do you hear much in the way of con contentions on energy efficiency? And if so, uh, what are they and what can we do as a group to kind of mute those contentions? Well, I think that a couple of years ago there was some apprehension on the part of some of the energy sectors that those who advocated for energy efficiency we're using it as kind of a stalking horse to oppose a particular 
energy production source that they favored. And I think we've gotten past that. You know, there's a different point of view about what energy and how to get energy and what are the better forms of energy. Uh, but I think there's been now everyone from Joe Bar Barton, who's a very uh, solid uh, carbon guy, uh, to Peter Welch, who probably is much more associated with renewables, saying, hey, efficiency can be evaluated on its own terms and it's not coming down on one energy sector or the other. That's my sense. And you've got so much experience with so many different forms of energy in Colorado. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I think one of the challenges that I'd <coughs> add to that is, is you do have some pushback because people automatically assume you're talking about a mandate or a standard that they may not want to, to be for or, or have some concern about. But what we're talking about is a way that you can do it with the private sector, that you're doing yeah. it with private sector innovation and, and know-how and just doing it, it, it through the target of, of, the, of the private sector. So, um, you know, if there's, push, if there's pushback, a lot of times we can work through that simply by explaining what we're trying to do. And, and I, for one, have, have been going back to my days in the state legislature as a Republican saying, hey, just because we talk about clean energy or renewable energy, don't let the hair on the back of your neck stand up every time we say that. There's ways to make this work that we can all agree to and make a, make a, a, a brighter future of energy because of it. So I think that's probably, we may have to uh, cut it off there. So, uh, But I want to thank everybody for, for Peter okay. and I coming thank here. Thank you very, thank you. very much. <laughs>
I'm Ross Eisenberg. I'm with the National Association of Manufacturers. We are the trade association representing the manufacturing sector writ large, and that is everybody from, we've got 12,000 members, that's everybody from Fortune 5 companies um, to, you know, the three-person machine shop in Skokie, Illinois. And uh, we operate as a democracy, so they all, they all have a voice, they all have an equal voice within our organization, and, and we bring that perspective to Washington. I mean, our job is to essentially advocate in Washington, advocate with the federal government, um, as to what matters for manufacturing. And that's why I'm glad to be here today. I mean, this matters to manufacturing. Um, we, uh, just a little bit of background about the way we view the world. Um, we believe we're on the, the cusp of a manufacturing resurgence. Um, we've had a couple tough years there, uh, but manufacturing is back. We're stronger than ever. And, uh, and we think with the right policies, we can be even better. Um, so our goals as an organization are these four right here up on the screen. Number one is that the United States will be the best place in the world to manufacture, and it'll, it'll attract foreign direct investment. Number two, we'll be the world's leading innovators, and that's something that matters significantly with respect to energy efficiency. Number three, we will expand access to global markets to enable manufacturers to reach the 95% of consumers who live outside of our borders. And goal four, we will have access to the workforce that the 21st century economy requires. So that is what colors everything that we do. And that colors, uh, again, is a, is a big reason why we're for energy efficiency. Now, um, we like to say, and we, we've got a study that supports this, we like to say that it's 20% more expensive to manufacture here relative to our nine largest trading partners. And that's because of a whole mess of things that go on here that make it difficult to manufacture. Policies on uh, torts, on trade, on taxes, just make it more expensive to manufacture here. Um, and that puts us at a significant disadvantage. Now, baked into that number, we actually have a slight competitive advantage relative to those same countries vis-a-vis -vis energy. And it's kind of easy to see why, right? I mean, we have everything, and we have a ton of everything. We've got, we've got the Saudi Arabia of coal. We're quickly becoming the Saudi Arabia of oil and gas. Um, we have, you know, 20% of our energy fleet coming from 100 nuclear power plants. Uh, we've got renewables growing by the day, by, by the hour, I mean, taking up an increasingly large market share. And we've got energy efficiency. We are becoming significantly more efficient even as the economy grows. I think it, just recently the manufacturing sector was another 3% as the economy grows. Um, so, you know, we think that with the right policies uh, here in Washington, we can widen that gap. We can make it even more attractive for manufacturers to come here because of this advantage we have from energy. Um, we like to say that we're for an all the above policy. And we really mean all of the above. We want all of it. Um, I, you know, you can't eliminate everything. It's all, it all matters. I have a, I would say, weekly, maybe monthly argument with my grammar people at the office when I write, we want all of the above, and then I list it all out, and I add energy efficiency at the end. They say, well, energy efficiency isn't a source of energy. I say, yes, it is. This is, the, this is the argument we're all having here. So, um, but we view it as part of the package, a very robust and important part of the package. Um, with, with the right policies in place, we can get there. Manufacturing has the highest multiplier effect of any sector of the economy. So investments in manufacturing, in, especially in, in energy efficiency, will multiply across the economy. It's not just, so it's in addition to saving the energy, you will create manufacturing multiplier type jobs, creating jobs, economic growth in other sectors. Um, frankly, manufacturing makes America strong. Now, getting into uh, efficiency specifically, uh, this is literally cut and pasted from our policy statement. They're available online. We've got about 25 other paragraphs on this, but this is the, these are the high points. Um, you know, we support energy efficiency policies. These were made, uh, we redo them every four years. They are made exclusively by the members. Um, a few of them are in the room. I mean, this is, this is what our members want. This is, this, is, this is where we are in energy efficiency. So um, if I can read tiny little print, we are uh, committed to reducing energy intensity and producing more energy efficient consumer products. Uh, and we, the last two paragraphs are basically, it matters in the industrial space too. So we make the things that make us more efficient as manufacturers. We also uh, need efficiency to help keep ourselves competitive in, as manufacturers. And in the industrial sector, that matters a lot. Uh, we, as manufacturers, use about a third of the energy produced in the United States. Um, the, uh, a number of, of the real energy intensives in iron and steel and chemicals and pulp and paper and places and, 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 and sectors like that, energy is generally their largest expense. So the more we can do to make it, to keep those costs down, both through increasing our sources of energy, but also making, making efforts to conserve it and, 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 and be more efficient, uh, matter significantly. So going into the past year, 
we saw the same opening that everybody else saw, right? We said, we've got a Congress that's relatively gridlocked, and we need to find an opening to, to, to do something important on energy. And this was where we arrived as the, the place that really we thought could be nonpartisan enough and could get agreement across the board that we could actually make some noise and maybe get Congress talking um, and, and actually pass something that, that would help. Um, and so we, I, I convened our Energy Efficiency Task Force. Uh, we spent a couple months drafting the principles on the left as really a sort of a picture as to, uh, of, and these are going to be posted on the ESI website, but it was a, a picture into sort of what we thought would make a real big difference for manufacturers, but that could actually be done in this Congress. Um, and, you know, that, that, are, that are essentially non-controversial, non-partisan enough that you could get 60, 70, 80 votes in the Senate for it. You could get a critical mass of Republicans and, and Democrats in the House on board for, this kind of, for, for, for these measures. And we've been, we've been up, we talked to leadership on both sides. We've had them up on the Hill since, I don't know, February or March or whenever we finish these things. Um, and a lot of these concepts have made it into legislation. Um, some good examples. So the SAVE Act. Uh, which, which deals with residential sector energy efficiency. Um, you know, that's, I don't want to say it's in here, safe tax rate, or no, it's, it's in there. Uh, you know, things, that, you know, just basically consumer transparency type issues, things that just make a lot of sense. We are, we are up here lobbying day in, day out to make sure that they happen. Uh, the building codes uh, language, things that, like that that made it an issue important. These are also things that the NAM is for, that manufacturers writ large are for. Um, you know, and, and this is not just a couple companies here and there. The, you know, when, I, when I put this out to my members, hey, should we do something on energy efficiency, uh, it was a resounding yes. And it was a resounding yes from companies across the manufacturing space. Um, companies that you never really thought would have an opinion on energy efficiency said yes. Um, you know, and, and that's because they're all kind of doing it. The stories are, are, are significant. Um, you know, I just wrote down a couple that I've, every time I hear one, I, I sort of write it down so I can share some of them with you. So Rockwell Automation is one of my members. They're a Fortune 500 company. They're a board member of the NAM. Uh, they recently helped Steelcase, the world's largest furniture manufacturer, reduce energy consumption by 15%, providing significant energy cost savings across the organization and reducing the overall carbon footprint by 25% by reducing the out replacing the outdated boiler control systems, implementing real-time tracking and monitoring system, and, uh, and, and enabling them to make the necessary changes to their efficiency improvements. Uh, Baldor Electric Company, they're an Arkansas manufacturer. They make a wide range of motors and drive products, and they can help save energy and reduce downtime in, in industrial and commercial locations. Um, they had one application where an old motor and a gearbox was removed and they, they, they put a new one in there. Uh, it saved energy by about 70%. I mean, this made a big difference to their clients, their clients' business. Um, Orion Energy Systems, they're a Wisconsin manufacturer. They specialize in energy efficient lighting, energy management controls, solar PV, and other technologies. They do business with 148 of the Fortune 500 and they've tallied total savings of more than two billion for them since 2001. Schneider Electric, they have stories galore. This is what they do. I mean, this is, what, this is what they do. They are a perfect example of what manufacturers do and why we care about it. So in terms of what we are trying to do uh, between now and, well, the end of next year, but certainly this Congress and others, we want to see Shaheen Portman done. We strongly support this bill. Um, we, my CEO stood next to the senators when they introduced it. We... Um, you know, we, we are doing everything in our power within the scope of the NAM's uh, abilities to try to get members to move this thing through the Senate and, and get it to the floor of the House and eventually the President's desk. Uh, we support it strongly. We, um, you know, we see this bill as a very smart, bipartisan, sensible way to do, frankly, exactly what Congressman Welch said which is to make some serious gains in the efficiency space for industrials and for residential sector and for commercial spaces, but in addition to get Congress talking again, get them talking about, about energy and use it as a building block to, 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 to a lot of other meaningful things. Um, I hear, I would say daily, weekly from members, when's this thing gonna get going? Will it get past the gridlock? We're doing what we can. Um, we really, 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 and I cannot underscore this enough, want to see this bill done. Um, it's a humongous priority for us, it's a top priority for us as an organization. In addition, we are strongly supportive of uh, ESPCs and UESCs, the performance contracting 
uh, initiatives that Congressman Gardner and Welch were talking about. Um, this is a map that, uh, that our members put together of where the components of an ESPC are manufactured. And you can see it's just about everywhere, right? I mean, this is something that goes, you know, really kind of spans the country. Uh, and it's, what's really interesting about this is it's not just the big guys. So much of this is being done by small and medium-sized manufacturers, really it's sort of the, the, the backbone of our country. Um, it is the small and medium-sized manufacturers that are making a lot of this really interesting, really unique, and really um, advanced equipment that is going into these ESPCs. Um, and these UESCs. So we are, uh, this is something that we've been pushing significantly both in, in the legislative space and, in the, uh, and in, the, in the executive space. The $2 billion program that the federal government has in place to the goal to, to, to get $2 billion of, of the ESPCs and USCs done, uh, they're almost finished with that. So that, that, that will be the end of this year. We want to see it re-upped. We want to see it five more years, $5 billion. Why not? These, for, you know, over time, ESPCs and USCs seem to be more or less driven by goals. If the goal's not there, they don't get done. Uh, we've seen tremendous, tremendous um, improvement uh, out of the federal government to utilize what is essentially a common sense, sort of mandate-free, uh, you know, mandate-free, federal grant-free program. You're, you're basically leveraging the, the, public, uh, the private sector to save uh, energy, and as you can see, create a ton of jobs across the economy. So we are all in on this as well, and we are calling on the administration to re-up these for five years and five billion dollars. Heck, it would be great if they could do it indefinitely. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is our presentation. I'm, I'm happy to talk. I guess we're going to do questions after the panel. Uh, looking forward to any questions we have, any discussion we can have. Um, just know that manufacturers are, are here. Uh, to lobby for efficiency, to promote efficiency across Washington and across the country. Uh, you know, we believe that, that our elected leaders need to choose policies that make this country a better place to invest, a better place to innovate, and a better place from which to, uh, to export. Energy efficiency is definitely one of these policies, so I'm very pleased and honored to be with you guys today. Uh, let's get that bill done. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Thanks so much, Ross. Um, I always love to hear the specific examples of how much savings um, people are able to, to get, which just so improves their bottom line and, and actually creates more jobs in terms of the companies that are helping other companies uh, find these savings. And in so many cases, it really does help companies become world-class competitors. And so the more that we understand all of this and can see the potential um, for uh, for these terrific kinds of stories, I think hopefully it will help really bring people together to uh, realize these gains. And 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 so as Ross said, Schneider Electric is a perfect example of a company that is making huge strides and for which energy efficiency is a major priority. And in 2006, energy efficiency was established as a core business initiative for Schneider Electric. And our speaker, Paul Hamilton, who had been with the company since 1998, was tapped to lead this whole energy efficiency company program. And in so doing, he has represented Schneider Electric across the country globally because of the, the whole scope of Schneider Electric's uh, uh, business. And uh, we are so glad to hear from Paul today, who is the senior VP for energy efficiency with Schneider Electric. Paul? Thank you. So um, today what I'd like to do is take what, what Ross did there and put a little more perspective on it and talk about some very specific examples to kind of drive down a little more and give you uh, how that worked. How did you work this thing? You guys do everything. You can't figure out how to use a There we go. Uh, so first off, a little bit about Schneider. We are a now about a $30 billion company. That's in euros up there. 40% uh, 40, 40 of our business is in new economies, or 140,000 people. We're in about 130 countries around the world. Basically, our business is energy management, all aspects in building, industry, um, data centers, uh, IT, residential. 
Uh, as you can see, it's pretty distributed across the globe where our business is. But that just gives you a little bit about the scope. In the U.S., we're about 7 billion, 20, or just over 20,000 people and 50 factories in the U.S. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit is about the opportunity. You know, what, you know, Ross kind of talked about some very specific examples, but I want to talk about it, the Schneider Company program that we embarked on in 2004 uh, saying that because we're in the business that we have to be, you know, we have to walk the talk and do exactly what we're asking our customers to do. So, but, uh, see, first off, you know, the energy efficiency, it's, it's, this is not a new, this is not something new. Uh, you can see from the AC AAE reports, this really came from uh, Steve Leitner, that from 1970 to 2008, 75 percent of our energy gains came from efficiency in other words we avoided we avoided the need to build new power plants because of engagement in efficiency and yet you say well that's a lot but they would also say that still there's about 25 to 30 percent available in the market today so even though we've gained a lot there's still another 30 percent available in the market today that we have not tapped. So there's a huge way to go, and as Ross said, it is a large untapped energy source. Um, the possibility, so again, I started out by saying this is the Schneider Electric Program. It's called Schneider Energy Actions. Uh, we started this in 2005, uh, and it started out with 18 U.S. sites. Uh, we expanded it to 51 sites in 2009. We joined the Better Buildings Initiative at the DOE, which commits you to 2.5% two, 2 2 per year, uh, which was easy for us to join because our internal goal is 4% per year. So Schneider Electric set an internal goal, 4% per year on our sites. Uh, what happened with that? Every plant had to have an energy leader. There was an energy action plan at every facility. Uh, we every plant had to install metering to bring raise the awareness of of what the energy was at that facility And then there were quarterly reviews and annual assessments of those plants. So basically Make a commitment put a plan in place to execute to that commitment And that's a lot about what energy efficiency is uh, As part of that we developed what we call a standard pra uh, standard practice manual which we published in the US and now is represented globally in Schneider so there is a standard practice that says here's what you do as a plant manager here's how you behave here's the kind of projects you see and what's what's required here's the results you can see that from 2005 to 2012 we have reduced our energy consumption by 30% 30% across the 51 plants that we would that we would have uh, uh, that we have engaged here that's 30 million dollars in cost savings 500 million kilowatts and 260,000 tons of co2 avoided so you can see that energy efficiency has a huge impact on the bottom line now that's all in the face of that that's not Schneider shrinking the business we grew our business substantially during that time period so you know, a lot of times they say, oh, you shrink the business, you save energy. That's true, but that's not what the case is here. Uh, down below, you can see just some actual, this was from uh, some actual savings across the years, uh, different, you know, across both electric and gas, and then the dollar savings that represented. As part of the DOE program, we also participated in one plant where we made a commitment to a deep retrofit and deep, deep energy savings. This was our Smyrna, Tennessee, which is just outside Nashville. Again, this is a plant that has 50% growth from when we started. It's a, it's a manu we make substation uh, assembled equipment there, so it's substa electric substations where we custom assemble them. And here you can see that uh, the savings were, I can't read the numbers now. I can't read them on my sheet and I can't see them there. So uh, whatever, 60% savings, and we've, re we've gone from about seven, seven uh, megawatts to three megawatts. On, on the bottom here, what's interesting, you see that we, this is a combination of both energy efficiency and we installed a uh, one megawatt solar farm that we, a uh, dual voltage solar farm that we share with TVA, that we build it and then we sell back to TVA and we use the energy ourselves. So the green represents the savings from the renewables, the red represents the savings from the energy efficiency measures, and the blue is the baseline. 
And the, the hard line is what would have actually been spent had we not, you know, had, had we not done anything. So this is just a good example of the kind of achievement that's available that, and, and what's out there. Now, the next thing is kind of what was available. There's a big question about when you do these projects, what are they, what's there? So these were the top types of, the top is kind of from the 50 plants, the type of projects, the big projects we did. You can see building management systems was a large one. This is just the management of all the facility, all the uh, controls in the system. Lighting projects, uh, energy efficiency compressors, variable speed drives. Uh, speed drives are simply, you know, putting some controls on a motor so they don't start. The, the analogy I like to use, it's the difference between the way uh, I drive the car and press on the gas pedal when I'm having to pay for the gas and the way my 17-year-old drives the gas when he doesn't have to pay for the gas. <laughs> so a drive is how I drive it. <laughs> Normally, if you don't have a drive, you just turn the motor on, it goes hard until it hits the speed, and that, that's uh, waste energy. So that's, what it, that's all a drive is when you hear that. Um, is that okay, Robert? Is that <laughs> <laughs> uh, occupancy sensors, compressed air leak detection, power factor, very simple projects. And the other thing you see on the bottom here, this is actually a list of things from an actual project. So very specific, but chilled water temperature reset, install clogged V-belts, uh, you know, and what you see here is we spent um, basically about, to save $50,000, we spent $50,000. It, all of these things were about one-year payment. A lot of simple things. A lot of this is standard, <coughs> ongoing maintenance in the plant to make sure the plant's running properly. So this is just now some generic things to give you an idea. And, and I want to, this is really, a lot of times when you hear energy efficiency, you don't know exactly what the specifics are. But small building management system, you see there's a PC, there's a lot of control components depending on what you're trying to control. These are a lot of boxes and devices that are manufactured at all those sites that Ross showed you around the, around the world, around the US. Monitoring and control, you know, this type of system can save up to 20% in an energy and in, a, in a building. This is compressor. So when you go into a building, these compressors actually compress uh, the fluid that helps you chill the building and, and run the air conditioning. And again, simply putting drives and controls. But what you see here, what I want to show you with the drive is there's a drive, that big gray box. That's just a computer controlled device. And then there's some wires and some contactors. There's a panel. So somebody has to put all that together. So basically, we sell the drive. We manufacture the drive in our facility. That ships to somebody else. They have to put it in a panel. Then you have all the contactor people, the wiring people, all these people, all the supply chain that makes all this stuff. Same thing here, power usage data centers. So we do a lot of data centers. And a lot of this is simply reorienting the data centers so that you, you're cooling one side and pulling. You know, you cool, it's a hot aisle, cool aisle. So rather than just cooling the building, you cool the aisles, you push the hot air into one aisle, and you pump it out the building just to make it more efficient. Again, a lot of infrastructure, some cooling, some power, a lot of uh, local integration. Um, industrial logistics, we do a lot of logistics things for you know, Walmart, Target, UPS, conveyor systems, a lot of motors, again, drives, control systems, turning the lights out in buildings when they're not using them. So a, a, a huge opportunity here, up to 50% energy savings we've seen in some of these sites. Um, and we also talked about ESCO. So this is a, a, a ESPC that we've done. Um, ESPCs basically take, we go in and we identify the energy savings. We guarantee that savings for 20 years, and we use that guarantee as a way to finance the capital project up front. So you, there's a utility bill. We we, you know, we find the savings, we use that savings to pay the bank for a financed loan. We give some of the savings back to the user, and at the end of the, after, after the payment is made, the user gets all those savings. We've done the Virginia, uh, the Virginia Community College system. You can see it's uh, 315 buildings. It was a $60 million project over four years. What's in there? Water, retrofit, thermal storage, lighting. This is all a contractor project at a local facility using local people. So 
exactly where are the jobs and where do they come from. So this gives you an example of, I don't think people understand when you hear there's a factory and a factory builds something and that's good for energy. Here's, here's kind of what the business really looks like. So you have at the bottom a bunch of factories that are making stuff. You know, whether it's a drive or a, or a lug nut or a piece of wire. And that stuff is the manufacturers, but most of that stuff goes to a distributor, which are regional. These are big <coughs> places that warehouse all this stuff. Then they go from there to panel builders to build you a panel, like the example I said. These are typically small, small job shops, electricians. From there, you have contractors, integrators, and OEMs who make this equipment. From there, it goes to the, the main contractor who might be managing the Virginia Hospital Center or the, uh, the Virginia House, the uh, Virginia Community College Center, and then to end users. So there's a huge food chain of people that are involved in these projects. So when Ross says manufacture, it's, you, you have to expand that as it goes up. And the closer you get to the end user, the more local that becomes, because those jobs cannot be outsourced. They're local people doing local work. So I wanted to give you a sense that when you hear about all this in factories, that there's, it's, it's more than just the factory. And lastly, just some perspectives. You know, where is the future? Where do we see the future of energy efficiency? What's going to be required to move this forward? Um, the big thing about energy efficiency is people. You know, one is it's people who are trained, people who have the right skills to do things, the right knowledge to be aware. It's management and leadership. As we told you with the plant, every plant had to have a manager and a, and a plan. That's key. I mean, because energy efficiency is a dynamic thing that you have to manage on a continuous basis. Uh, processes like 5001, SEP, these are DOE processes being driven right now. Visibility, energy is invisible. You have to give it visibility. This requires meter, uh, metering, performance, reporting, uh, tools, better ways to validate and measure energy is key. Uh, the utilities still have a big problem, especially with complex systems, validating that the savings are actually there. Um, technology, uh, data enabling. Everything has to be data enabled. That allows you to collect the information, report it, make it visible, and then, and then, make, uh, and then challenge, the, uh, challenge the savings. So inhibitors, still low awareness and inadequate skills we see as a big part of uh, the problem. Uh, limited incentives for designers, you know, there's still a lot of mixed incentives where building owners don't necessarily are incentivized to invest in energy efficiency because they're short-term focused. Um, comparative, under, you know, comparative usage, benchmarking basically. Uh, system solution integration me and measurement and verification we talked about. Financing, incentive misalignment. We still have to align incentives so all, all aspects of the supply chain are incentivized to invest in energy efficiency. Um, regulation, uh, just really implementing all the codes and policies that are out there. There's a lot of states that are still not running at the current code level or certainly don't enforce the current code level. So there's still a lot of opportunity just in implementing a lot of the things that are out there. And lastly, uh, what's needed? Uh, again, j this is really just addressing the last list, uh, some policy intervention around the where the misplaced incentives are, where we have distorted regulations around uh, utility engagement, distributed generation, demand response, unpriced cost of goods. You know, this is the cost of services, education, uh, environmental costs that are not cost into the hard cost of energy savings. Um, let's look at things that exist today, where, where they can be improved, state programs that are good. A lot of states have great programs, a lot of states have nothing. Uh, utility decoupling, energy efficiency resource standards, equipment standards, where can these be improved? Energy Star is a great one that's out there. How do we continue to drive that, make it better? And lastly is putting policy in the right place. You know, not all policies at the federal level, things need to be implemented where they can be most in impactful and control, whether it's local, state, or federal. So that's it. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, so, Paul, it sounds like we still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> In terms of problem solving, a lot of these important areas that, uh, that Paul illustrated in terms of thinking about 
first of all, all of the things that have been unlocked through improvements in resource efficiency, but still a lot of hurdles that we need to, to problem solve and um, that would be really good for all of us working together to, to come together and do that. We're not going to hear from Maria Kingery, who is the CEO and co-founder of Southern Energy Management. Uh, she and her husband founded this firm in 2001. It draws upon her many years of experience in sales, marketing, and business development. So they uh, are, she's bringing these skills to, to bear in terms of looking at business development um, through sustainability in, and um, sound energy practices. Uh, located in North Carolina, she is very, very active in many state um, sustainable energy organizations and alliances. So we're anxious to hear from you, Maria. All right, thank you, Carol. And uh, I have to say, I know Paul and Ross, you guys do this all the time. I don't do this very often. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's really interesting and I'm honored to be here to talk about energy efficiency, especially within the context you know, from a small business owner, but also as a citizen, I mean, the possibility that this could be something that could generate bipartisan support and that we could make some real progress is just really exciting. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am mainly going to talk about my experience and the experience of our customers. Um, so we are, we also do rooftop solar, so we do energy efficiency and solar work. Founded in 2001, today we're a team, very small company, 60, 60 team members. Um, we serve homeowners, builders, developers, real estate developers, and business owners in the southeast of mid-Atlantic, and, and there are people who love what they do. So what do we do? So we provide building energy efficiency and renewable energy solutions to residential and commercial markets. Um, we do residential PV and solar water heating. We do integrated planning for both homeowners and builders and develop developers. So if somebody comes to us and says, I want to build a more energy efficient home, I want to build a more energy efficient neighborhood, more sustainable, we do a lot of green building consulting, we can do all of those things. Um, we do, for, for end users, for homeowners at this time, we do residential solar, um, and we also do um, some diagnostics and some HERS ratings. Their HERS ratings is Home Energy Rating System. I'll talk a little bit more of that, about that in a little bit. And then commercial, we do um, solar work. We're currently not heavily involved, um, except lighting. We're very excited about the opportunity to help combine lighting and renewables to really drive those cost savings down. So I put a slide in here how we do it. So we aspire to improve the way people make and use energy. I mean, that's what gets us up in the morning. And it's what's gotten us up in the morning for the last 12 years. And, and I work with my husband, remember. He's my business partner. So it, <laughs> you know, it, 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 some days it's more challenging than others. And you know, I'll add, just on a personal note, the reason that we started this company, we both came out of a company called Burt's Bees, and we saw it, just enjoyed tremendous growth and we saw what you know an entrepreneur could do so Roxanne Quimby and Bert Shavitz when they started their company the category natural personal care products did not exist now it's a multi-billion dollar worldwide industry so we were inspired by that and we said well hey what can we do um, and we actually we had a child on the way so and and September 11th occurred and we recognized that energy was a big challenge and what could we do? So this really is, I tell people, it's a labor of love. We are very serious about what it is that we're doing and being the best at what we're doing. Um, but we're serious about transforming the way people make and use energy. And we want to do it as a business in a way that also um, benefits our stakeholders, our team members. We believe in all of those things. And we see energy efficiency as a tremendous opportunity to create these wins. So we've been a National Energy Star Partner of the Year for seven years in a row. Um, that is something that our team is extremely proud of. We have really enjoyed being the partnership with the Energy Star Program. And um, I like to think, it, was, it says there, we um, have won a Market Transformation Award. When we started um, our business in 2000 and, uh, 
2001, there were very, very, very little market penetration, and now we're at about 35%. So we're really proud of that work um, and others. So in our, in our business, we talk about walk, jog, run. So, and have for many, many years, is a way to really connect with home builders primarily, and also homeowners, about where, what do we do, right? So everybody wants to live in a more energy efficient home. Everybody wants to save money every month, but how do we do it? And so from our, we talk with folks about, you start with energy efficiency. I mean, that is the foundation of everything that we do. Um, and then we add on more green building as you want to progress. Um, and you want then eventually running is, you know, taking on more renewables and, and really driving your dependence on uh, traditional fuels down. You know, this I also think is, is a really good um, metaphor for what we're looking to accomplish here, right? I mean, we're talking about walking. Let's, let's start walking. Um, this, is, this is not a heavy, re a big reach. Um, so we do third party verification. So our people go out into the field. And one of the main things that they do now with energy codes improving, one of the main things that they do is go out. Now we're not, ins we're not inspectors. We don't work for the government, right? We don't work for any regula regulatory agency. But what we do is we go in and we verify for the builder that the uh, standards that they have set that they want to create for their customer is being met. This is very market driven. The builder sets the level that they want to achieve and then we help them to make sure that they do that. Um, so I started this out with, I, we're talking about win-wins. This is a win, I think this is a win for everybody. I mean, everybody wins in this. And again, just concentrating on the residential sector. The home buyer wins because the home buyer gets a more affordable, comfortable, durable, valuable home. Um, the builder and the seller win um, because, as you'll see on some, some uh, on my next slides, they sell their home. They sell more homes faster for more money. Um, real estate agents win because they have a new selling point. Appraisers win because they um, are able to communicate the value of these homes. And lenders win because then they are able to um, they are able to evaluate the the uh, cost that it's going to actually cost people to live in a home. So we talk about what a mortgage price is. That's a piece of what it costs to own a home. You also have to think about um, what it costs to actually live in that home. So these are the things that the homeowners get, right? And it's interesting, the National Association of Home Builders did a study recently and found that energy efficiency was rated number one as what home builders, uh, home buyers want. I mean, so they want this stuff. And uh, that is a tremendous uh, accomplishment. Builders and sellers and real estate agents get, this is some data that I took from the Triangle MLS, 36% of the homes that were sold were energy rated in quarter one of 2012. Of those homes, they were roughly 11% higher sales price and they spent 21% less, percent less time on the market. So again, more homes faster for more money. For lenders, this is a recent study that was done by the UNC Institute for Market Transformation. They discovered that energy rated homes have a 32% lower default rate and a 9% greater value versus unrated homes. So that's, these are the different parts of the value chain. And again, you know, I wrote up here, what's next? One of the things, that, and what, the other thing I think is really interesting about all of us, we're all aligned. I mean, we've got everybody from, you know, large multinational to somebody representing all manufacturers to me who's representing a small company and then home builders. We're all aligned in that we, we agree that we need standards. Um, the SAVE Act was mentioned. That is one that we believe will really help to set standards that everybody knows, understands, can agree on, and can move forward with. Um, and we also need market signals. We need consistency so that pe in people who want to innovate in this space can uh, comfortably and confidently make investments. 
Um, so what's next for for our company and the example of us? So we have we're looking constantly to innovate and find new ways to add value for our customers. We work with builders, everyone from the very small custom home builder who may build three or four homes a year to large national <laughs> builders. Um, really where our sweet spot is, is in the regional builders who may build two or three hundred homes a year. And with some of those builders, we actually found that they increased their business during the recession. So a lot of builders did not enjoy that um, experience, but many of our, again, this is in a, in a specific part of our market, um, but the regional builders that were able to, they had a good infrastructure built, um, they were able to increase their, their business. And uh, not by a lot. Of course, now the market is picking back up in North Carolina, and so they're, they're growing at a much more rapid pace. Um, but we believe that um, we need a consistent, easy to understand for the consumer uh, awareness for what does it mean. So even Energy Star rating, they know the Energy Star. They know um, that that is something that they want. They're asking for it. But we feel that there's a real need to gather around and get consistent around a standard that everyone can understand. And we believe we're advocating that should be the HERS rating, um, the Home Energy Rating System, that then multiple, multitudes of programs and different um, organizations can create programs around that. Um, we are working on one called EcoSelect, which would has the ability to encompass whatever program that any locality may want to build to. And we're launching this on a national basis with other people who do what we do for a living. And we're really excited about that. Um, so I put these slides in here so you guys could see. So here's where we started. I mean, and then we grew a little bit, and then we grew a little bit more, and then we grew a little bit more, and then we really grew, and then we decided that we had grown to the point where we wanted to divest part of our company, so I say we matured, and uh, this is our current team. And going back to them, you can't, I don't know how well you can see their faces, but the thing that is great about getting to go to work every day is that these people love what they do. And let me tell you, a lot of them, they do hard work. They climb up on roofs. They climb around in crawl spaces. I mean, snakes, spiders, you know, they've seen it all. But they believe that they're making a difference. And they believe that they are not only helping their own family, it's something they can be proud of, but they're helping other families. And the last slide I put on here is that everyone deserves to live in an affordable, comfortable, and valuable home. And some of the work that I'm the proudest of is work that we've done within the affordable housing community. Because those homeowners are the ones where saving energy really makes a difference for them. One of our team members came back. He had gone to a ribbon cutting for a multifamily project that we worked on where we did some uh, energy efficiency standards. I believe it was built to the um, Energy Star standard. And he came back and he was telling us, how's your day? And he had tears in his eyes because he said that an elderly woman had come up to him with her energy bill uh, in her hand and said, you know, my energy bill at the last place I lived was a couple hundred dollars. I just got my first energy bill and it was like $38. For her, she said it made the difference between being able to afford a certain medication. Now we hear those types of sound bites. Our people experience that every day. And so, you know, we, the things that, this is really something that we can get behind that touches people on a very, very human level. And it's good for our country. It helps us to be more energy independent. Everybody wins. So, thank you. Okay. Um, thanks so much, Maria. Um, and I think it is very, very powerful when you see what a difference it makes for individual um, 
f citizens for, for individual homeowners and what it means in terms of having something that's affordable and much more comfortable, healthy, um, et cetera. And, and so we've really kind of looked at across a broad spectrum today and so that you can see how each of these really do relate to each other and in terms of sort of the the web that connects things because in each case there is also a very important supply chain, a value chain that is also involved. Um, but let's open it up for your questions or comments. We have about 15 minutes. Do we have any? Okay. Go ahead, Alice. Do you want to go to the microphone? So um, there is a nationwide network of people who do what I do for a living and we're called home energy raiders. Of course, you can, you can find me and my information at um, www.southern-energy.com if you're interested in what we're doing with EcoSelect, which is, again, really helping to, to educate and communicate very clearly with the consumer. You can look at getecoselect.com. Um, ResNet.com is also another resource for you. There are p companies like ours across the nation that do this work. Um, and I'm sure word of mouth makes a big difference. It really does, yes. That I think <laughs> that that's really, really a critical thing yes. that should not be underestimated. Okay, over here. I have a question for Ross. Okay. Um, Come out, Ross. Hi. <laughs> So in the growth agenda, um, in terms of how the, the four goals that I set out? Yeah, and how do you plan on like, measuring whether those So that's a very good question. And luckily, I'm the energy guy and not the I, IP guy, or I, uh, uh, intellectual property guy. Um, you know, I, again, this is, this is a sort of set of policy goals. You know, we want to see innovation happen. We want to see the right policies that will make innovation happen. I mean, you know, a lot of it's going to be anecdotal. I frankly don't know the kind of measurement that you can do for that kind of stuff. Um, but you kind of, you know, you can kind of see it. I mean, usually, I mean, so natural gas. Let's use natural gas as an example. Um, innovation brought the vast amounts of natural gas and the very, very serious discussions we're having over the policy, our nation's policy over natural gas, because of the innovations that, that led to hydraulic fracturing and, 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 uh, and, and horizontal drilling. Um, you know, a lot of discussions we're having on, you know, ESPCs are because of the innovations that led to, um, that led to the technologies that allow for this, you know, significant energy savings, more so than, than the federal government's even paying uh, in, in the ESPCs. So uh, to answer your question, I honestly, like, uh, you know, they are, they are aspirational documents. The goal document is this is what we, this is the manufacturing agenda and what we want to see done. Um, you know, it's an excellent question, but I don't know that I have a very easy answer for you on sort of how we're going to measure whether or not we're getting there on innovation. So I'll, I'll just address it from a company standpoint. I mean, I think one of the things that we measure in, inside a company as far as innovation is IP and patents. That's clear. That's fairly straightforward and easy to do. But it does not really reflect exactly what happens in the market. So really from a business perspective, innovation for us is – around the core strategy, what new offers or products do we have, and how much business does that generate for the company. So that's the way we measure it. So when we're looking at energy management as a strategy for Schneider Electric, it's where are new opportunities and what things have we created that have generated new business or uh, growth revenue for the company. And that, that's, that's the way it's measured. rating will be one of the ways to achieve compliance. Um, and it's great what you're doing with, you know, the number
some of the builders you're working with, but unfortunately around the country, the home builders are, are some of the most active groups opposing the adoption of the new energy codes. And so hopefully this new provision, uh, which adopts the HERS rating as a way to get to, uh, you know, to demonstrate <coughs> compliance, will get some of those home builders to uh, you know, support adoption of the, of the current code. And hopefully folks like you uh, at the state level will also uh, lend your voices because North Carolina, there's a big battle going on right now. Yeah. Based on the 06 code, so. Thank you for bringing that up. There is a national organization that I actually work with called the Green Builder Coalition that are build. So this is not uh, universal. There are lots of builders out there who really would like to see these adopted, and uh, there are we're working on that every day. So thank you for that, and we're going to make the fight. We are we're going to work on it, in North Carolina, for sure. Okay, back here. Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> can you read your question, please? Can, can you read when deployment and development? What's so, so if you're talking about, um, about having a limited resource base, where do you, what's the appropriate balance of investing in infrastructure and then also having the capacity to deploy those resources and then having the capacity to deploy those resources in the future? And are you talking from a governmental policy perspective? So that, that's a very interesting question. So our, our policy basically, you know, says there's an important federal role in both. I mean, there, you know, we've got there's an important federal role in, in policy, you know, in, in, in an R&D, and there's an important federal role in, in deployment. Um, it's hard to kind of differentiate where you should be spending your money. You know, our position is both. I mean, we really need both. And this kind of applies broadly to all energy, all, all energy types. Um, yeah, I mean, so... I, it's a good question for the appropriators. I don't necessarily know that I would have an easy answer other than we want to see a way that both of these things, you know, have both private sector investment and to the extent we can get it, uh, federal investment. So we have an opinion on that. But, uh, <laughs> um, and what I would say, I, I would agree with what Ross said. I think that right now there's a tendency by especially some of the key agencies that are involved in this to focus on advanced R&D. Certainly advanced R&D is very necessary. It's things like, you know, new materials that will make cars more efficient, uh, uh, 3D uh, manufacturing, you know, this the 3D printing, which could reduce manufacturing process. So very advanced things where companies on the, their own cannot invest in. That's a good, great role for the government. Um, as far as the government selecting short-term technologies, I think that's the role of private industry. And um, that's where we think that the government's role should be more about breaking down barriers to deploy those things, whether those things are the financial incentives, uh, the, the, code, the codes that we talked about, uh, policy or programs to encourage deployment, like the Better Plants and Better Buildings initiatives. Uh, so I think that's where the government can help move markets forward, but allow the companies and the end users to select and, and, and innovate in those areas to, to compete for that business and, and bring the best offers forward. So yeah, I, there's I, a core balance. That, yeah, and that, that balance is very important. I mean, certainly with respect to all sort of energy policy, we know the government's not particularly good at picking winners and losers in the energy space. Um, and when it decides that we should do X as a matter of law, it, they're usually wrong, right? I mean, so, um, I mean, I, there's a long list of times that they've been wrong, no matter what the administration and what the Congress. So, um, yeah, I think the, Paul's sort of balance is really actually where we need to be. I mean, you know, there should be some some federal element, and that's really why you see a lot of this legislation still kind of percolating up, because we there is a place for the federal government here to help break down those barriers and, and, and let the market work and let it work well. And I would say one of the things from a policy tax, just to talk about tax incentive, we've been working with uh, NEMA specifically on some performance-based tax incentives. So you could look at 
instead of allowing even the incentives to pick a particular technology, find ways to make things technology neutral and more performance based. This is why we like standards like ISO 50001, uh, some of the better buildings, the BEQ. These are performance based initiatives that say that I'm here, I improve to here, and let the owner decide how to do that. Let the companies innovate and bring technologies that are going to bring the best practice. So for us, we would prefer to see much more performance-based solutions rather than technology selection. Uh, obviously, if we say select technology, we're going to say select ours, but <laughs> he's going to say select his, and he's going to say select his, and then you end up with a tax code that looks like this, you know, so. Does that have anything to do with all of the above? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back here. Perhaps I, I, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I mean, absolutely. Why, why don't you both talk about that? So uh, water, so we, uh, we along with the several other companies in this room, Siemens, uh, I don't know who else is here, GE, uh, others, uh, a, a huge business for us is water, wastewater treatment. And water and wastewater treatment is simply a lot of motors running a lot of pumps with a lot of electrical control. So the management of water is critical there's a huge amount of energy use in the in the transportation movement and treatment of water uh, and we see great opportunities there in europe uh, the uk for instance has mandated all municipal water plants have a set reduction so uh, both from a carbon perspective which really drives them back to efficiency um, so I think there's an interest. The water market is a very disaggregated market today. It's, it's very challenging because it's typically municipal run. And as you know, municipals are not cash rich today. So it's, it's a dilemma where they know there's an opportunity, but they don't have the money or the, or the financial stability to create bonds to invest. So it's a challenge. But the opportunities there, I think people recognize the opportunity, both in the treatment at the big plants and the usage, which brings you back to the appliances, whether it's shower heads or toilets or whatever. Yeah, I mean, and, and certainly in the in the con congressional sort of lobbying context, we were active behind the scenes on Stream Portman and trying to get you know suggest some policies to them on the, in the water space that actually could fit well into that bill and could make a difference along the lines of what uh, what they did on energy. Um, we absolutely see a nexus there, and and all the same reasons that we support energy efficiency uh, as, as, you know, good for the manufacturing agenda, we, we feel that way on water too. They haven't learned to frack water yet. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, at our scale as well, one of the things we did with EcoSelect, we felt like Energy Star didn't address that, and there's a water sense program, they're separate. We feel like they should be together. I mean, this is all about resource management and stewardship, so. Great, so you're also addressing that yes. in your work. Terrific. Okay. Over here. Go ahead. Just want to follow up to uh, Brian. I've certified a lot of buildings for the the building system of this program. One of the correct specific water management and the reading of the water in the building was downtown building a building in downtown DC, about four hundred thousand square feet of the water rate parking used in nineteen in two thousand though not two years. Um, point well taken. I think that there is not a terrific appreciation about the enormous nexus in terms of water and energy and is something that um, we're very, very interested in looking at in considerable more detail. And I know that there are a number of congressional offices that are very concerned about this too, particularly as we look at all sorts of water constraints across the country and that the issue is becoming ever ever um, greater. Um, any other last comments? 
Okay, then I want to thank our panel very, very much and also encourage you, if you can, to head over to the Canon Caucus Room for the Alliance to Save Energies Great Energy Efficiency Day because there will be another um, great uh, uh, group of people that will be uh, talking, speaking about energy efficiency opportunities there as well. And thank you to our wonderful, wonderful panel. Really appreciate it.